One of the last recorded acts in the Gospel of John is Jesus giving to Peter a very difficult burden, something I'm sure that most of us would struggle with. Peter handled it well, and the Lord knew that he would handle it well. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Peter knew he was not going to die of natural causes. Peter knew that the Lord had revealed to him that when he was old, and of course that's a relative term, so I don't know when Peter started thinking about this. The studies we know are that he was probably in his 30s, about the same age as Jesus, when he was called to become an apostle. He wrote the last letter of his uh, life probably about 25, 30 years later, so he would have been somewhere in his 60s. But he had to carry that burden. He knew he would suffer a death of violence. I often wonder what Peter thought in Acts chapter 12. He'd been taken where he didn't want to go. James had already had his head taken from him. He had been beheaded. And that next morning, Peter was going to have to get up and be carried where he didn't want to go to have his head removed. And yet, what he thought was a vision turned out to be God sending an angel and sparing his life and giving him many more years of service. But I'm sure every time Peter got himself into a situation of persecution, he remembered this because it was something that he carried his entire life. And so when he wrote his second letter, he knew he was, it was drawing near and he used it. That's why I think it's important for us to recognize this because he's going to refer to it in just a moment. And what was Peter's great concern at that moment? Not that he was going to die, but that he wasn't going to be here anymore. He felt the same way. You remember Paul in, in Philippians chapter one, when Paul said to depart and be with Christ is very far better Yet to remain is more needful for you. So I'm in a strait between the, the two. I have, I have a difficult choice here. I don't know which one to choose. Because to be with Christ is very far better. But I want to stay to help you. So what's his great concern here? Just like Paul. To leave his brethren remembering the most important things. And so... Peter says this in 2 Peter 1, verse 14, knowing that the putting off of my tabernacle comes swiftly, even as our Lord Jesus Christ signified unto me. So Peter knows this violent death, the arrest, the taking where I don't want to go, and the type of death that I'm about to die, it's getting very close now. It's very near. So what does he say in verse 15? I will give diligence that at every time you may be able after my decease to call these things to remembrance. Now these things that Peter's talking about is not the fact that the Lord signified that he would die a violent death. These things are the things that Peter has just finished speaking about. And what he's done here is the same thing that we do when we take a highlighter and we highlight a certain portion of scripture and we tell ourselves, this is especially important to me. Now, our reasons are arbitrary, but the Holy Spirit here is stamping with divine inspiration the fact that what Peter has just finished talking about is to Peter's mind and therefore to the Holy Spirit's mind, since he's stamping it, a very, very important part of the scriptures. And then he says it again. Most assuredly, I, oh, I'm sorry, this, that's the verse. I'm going to skip that. Let's read the whole verse now. And I want you to notice that there's three things. You see the three pure purple words there. There are three things 
that Peter wants us to do with this truth. So let's read. Wherefore, I shall be ready always to put you in remembrance of these things, though you know them and are established in the truth which is in you. I think it right, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that the putting off of my tabernacle cometh swiftly, even as our Lord Jesus Christ signified to me. Now let's just stop there for a moment and let's think about what Peter has just said and what the Holy Spirit has just stamped with divine inspiration. First of all, Peter is urgently ready to put you in remembrance of these things. Now the Greek word these things always points back to whatever it is he's just finished talking about. And there's a section of scripture here starting in verse 3 and going through uh, verse 11 that is of critical importance for Christians. It's something that we should remember. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say, you already know them, which means he's been busy. He's been preaching this over and over. This isn't the first time they've heard this. It's the first time it's been written. Peter hasn't written this down before, but that's the purpose of written revelation, is to record what the apostles and prophets had already been revealing through the Holy Spirit who was in them. That's what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, how that by revelation was made known to me, whereby when you read, you can have my understanding. So here's Peter's understanding. I believe that these things are very important and you need to remember them even though you already know them and you're already established in the truth. Then verse 13, he adds this extra punch. I think it right, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that the putting off of my tabernacle comes swiftly, even as our Lord Jesus Christ signified to me. Now, Peter didn't have to reveal this to us. But the Holy Spirit wanted it revealed. I'm about to die. You know, when I'm on my deathbed, and I'm talking to my children, I'm not going to be talking about flipping things. My time is short. And I'm going to talk about the things that are the most important things to think about. Then in verse 15, he sums it all up. And that's really what he's just done. I've given diligence. I've put forth my greatest efforts. I've told you that you already know these things. I've told you that you need to remember these things. I've told you that the Holy, that the Jesus has uh, signified that I'm about to die and the one thing I want you to do after I'm dead is remember these things. So now verse 15, I will give diligence that at every time you may be able after my decease to call these things to remembrance. Now, as I say, if that's not highlighting this section and saying you need to remember this, now am I saying it's not more important than any other passage of scripture? No, I'm not saying that. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. But some of the scriptures, as I say, they have a special punch to them. And God has given this one a very special punch by saying, you know, the scriptures don't usually repeat themselves. For him to say remember three times in one passage and for him to emphasize in all these different ways, I shall be ready. I shall give diligence. I think it right. I want you to remember. You know these things, but I want you to remember them. And so the question that I would have to ask myself right now and you is, have you read 2 Peter 1, 3 through 11? Do you know them? Can you remember them? Are we fulfilling Peter's desire here? Peter says, after my decease, I want you to be able to call these things to remembrance. Well, Peter's dead. And we have this legacy that he's lit, written here. I want you to remember, I want you to remember, I want you to remember even though you know. And so most of you who have heard me preach on this before know that this is one of my favorite passages. I wish I could preach it every week, but I know you get tired of it after a while. But I think it's that important. And when you've heard this before, you'll hear it again. But it's very, very important. And as I say, I don't have any apologies to make. Peter himself said, you need to remember this. And so, can we call them to remembrance? Can you, have you memorized those seven things that Peter has asked to add to our faith? Have we looked at the six blessings that will come to us if we have added these things to our faith? And have we recognized that Peter started this section in verses three and four and five by saying, 
God has given us his exceedingly great and precious promises. He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Therefore, you need to add on your part, add to your faith, and then those seven things. If we don't know those things, if we can't remember those things, if we're not working on those things, then we're missing out on the very thing that Peter asked us to do here. Now, I can't memorize the whole Bible, but I can memorize the critical portions of the Bible. Just like my life. You say, what's your social security number? Well, I can give that to you. Well, what's your birthday? I can give that to you. What's your wife's social security number? I don't know. Ask her. I don't know it. You don't know your wife's social security? No, I don't. I don't. Uh, Einstein said, you don't waste your time memorizing things that don't have any need. I don't have any need to give her social security number. She does. I'm not deprecating that. I'm just saying that there's things in the scriptures that I can't quote. But there's other things in the scriptures that I can't quote. Why do I make those choices? Well, when Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount at the end, if you do these things, you're like a wise man building on rock. And if you don't do these things, you're like a fool building on sand. Well, that caught my attention. So I've memorized the Sermon on the Mount. And I can tell you about the Beatitudes and the you have heard that it was said, but I say, and to be noticed by man. And I can go through that sermon because I know I need to be doing those things. <clears throat> So, as I mentioned, and we can just scan this real quick, the Holy Spirit inspired Peter to say these things. They weren't his thoughts. These were the Holy Spirit's thoughts. You remember what Paul said? Not in words which man's wisdom speeches, or sorry, not in words which man's wisdom teach, but which the Spirit teaches. Combining spiritual things with spiritual words. The Holy Spirit wanted us to know how Peter felt as he made this request. You know, I have a lot of respect for Peter. I have a lot of respect for Paul. They're two of the key Bible characters. The book of Acts, the first 12 chapters are about Peter. The last chapters from 13 to 28 are about Paul. They, Paul told Timothy, I want you to follow my example. I want others to follow my example. This is how we show our spiritual maturity. And the same thing is true here with Peter. And so when Peter says, this is how I feel, well, you know something? I feel the same way. I feel like I need to know these things and you need to know these things, just like Peter said, we need to know. They're stamped with divine inspiration. Since Peter was so focused on them, shouldn't we pay special attention to them? Shouldn't we be able to quote them? Shouldn't we be able to say, I've added these things to my faith, that I have done these things? He said they knew them and could remember. Now, can I say that about the people here? If I handed out a piece of paper right now, I said, close your Bibles and summarize Hebrew, or excuse me, first, second Peter chapter one, verses three through 11, summarize it for me. Show me what verses three and four say about his precious and exceedingly great promises and his eternal power. Tell me what I'm supposed to do about my part to escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Tell me about the seven things that we add to our faith. Tell me about if these things are yours, you won't be idle, you won't be unfruitful, you won't be blind. Your entrance into the eternal kingdom will be abundantly supplied and you will never stumble. Brethren, what a bunch of wonderful promises. Conditional promises based on our efforts. And that's exactly what he said in the beginning. Adding on your part. God's done his part. But without our part, you know, it's like when you build a house, you put water in, put electricity in, but you put a little faucet and you put a little switch because without the input of the person living in the home, you won't have access to that water or to that electricity. Switches have to be flipped. The power of the gospel, these are the switches. This is the faucet. This is the means by which God has dispensed these things to us. And so we need to be aware of them. So can we remember them? Now, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11, as I said, it's an amazing passage. In verses 3 through 5, God gives us the means and the motivation. Then in verse 5, he gives us reasons. Then in verses 5 through 7, he says there are seven things to add to your faith. Then in verses 8 to 11, he says these are the six blessings that you will receive if you have them. Then I will be careful so you remember so in order to remember, what do we have to do? Well, if you can't, some people can't memorize. Some people, it doesn't matter what they do, they can't memorize. Well, then take, you know, every Bible has a few pages that are blank. Write them in there and go through them. 
Peter says, I want you to know them. I want you to be established in them. And I want you to remember them. Because if you don't, you're going to be blind, idle, unfruitful. Your calling and election will be unstable and you won't know if you're going to make it or not. And your entrance into the eternal kingdom, you may not have enough. Now, these aren't my words. These are Peter's words inspired by the Holy Spirit. So now I have my marching orders. I only have seven things that I need to, to master in order to understand this passage of Scripture. And that's all I have to do. It's just from day to day, as you pray, as you think, how's my virtue? How's my knowledge? How's my self-control? How's my perseverance? My godliness? My brotherly kindness? And my love? Seven things added to faith. And now I can be busy. I can be fruitful. I can see clearly. I can make my calling and election stable and steadfast. I will never stumble. And an entrance into the eternal kingdom is going to be supplied to me. What an honor. So he starts out in verses 2 through 4 saying this. Grace to you and peace be multiplied in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. You know, if you read all the New Testament epistles, about 95% of them start with grace and peace. You know why they start with grace and peace? Because when the Greeks met each other, they would say grace. One would say charis, the other would say charis. Just like we say good morning or good afternoon. They would say charis to each other. When the Hebrews met each other, they would say peace, shalom, shalom. They would speak to one another, shalom, shalom, grace and peace. The Greek greeting, the Hebrew greeting, those greetings are now being sent down from heaven and they're multiplied by the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. So grace from God and grace and peace from God. You see, when I say grace to you or good morning to you, I don't have the power to give you a good morning. I'm wishing you a good morning. Hope everything goes well today. When the Greeks said grace to each other, they were saying, hope your day is filled with gifts that you didn't deserve and blessings that, that you didn't work for. That's what grace is. Gifts that you don't deserve and blessings you didn't work for. What about peace? That means absence of conflict. No problems today. Everything's going smoothly. No problems. No stress. No trials or tribulations. Grace and peace are multiplied in what? The more we know about God and the more we know about Jesus Christ, the more grace, the more peace. Then in verse 3, seeing that. Now seeing that ties us back to why there's grace and peace. There's grace and peace in the knowledge of God because or seeing that God's divine power has granted unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Now we read about God's divine power. We see it in the creation. In the beginning earth was formless and void no sun no moon no stars no trees no plants no animals no man nothing divine power of god you know if god hadn't done all that he did in genesis chapter one we'd have a pretty bleak existence wouldn't we if we didn't have the sun the moon and the stars if we didn't have all the beautiful amazing things that god made on the six days of creation and rested on the seventh but that's not peter passes over that because that isn't the critical thing because this world is going to end. But it's that his divine power has granted unto us everything that pertains or is necessary to life and godliness. You know, without God doing that, Romans chapter 1 through 8 is an explanation of God. You can't do it on your own. All is sin and fall short of the glory of God. I'm going to condemn the first, the first generation apostates in chapter 1 and all their descendants. Because they're without excuse and they're sinning. I'm going to condemn all the morally minded, upright people who think that, that they're serving me, but, they're, they, but they can judge other people and condemn them. And I'm going to condemn all the Jews because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But then in chapter 4, Paul says, but now a righteousness of God has been revealed apart from the law of the prophets. And he talks about Abraham and how Abraham's faith was reckoned to him for righteousness. 
and how you and I are the children of Abraham and that because of the power of the gospel, you remember chapter 1, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation, seeing that his divine power has granted unto us the gospel. The gospel and all things pertaining to life and godliness are synonymous. So God has given us the gospel. But you know something? Without our faith and without our faithfulness, that gospel is not going to be very helpful to us. Verse 4. Whereby? Because his divine power has made it possible, he's now able to grant us his precious and exceedingly great promises. Eternal life. Answered prayer. Forgiveness. Wisdom. Success. Honor. He has granted us his Precious, exceeding great promises. Now I call verse 3 the means, and I call verse 4 the motivation. I want to go to heaven. The means for me to go to heaven is in the gospel. And the motivation is in the promises. Through the means and the motivation, through these Want to see how that green came out? Yeah, you can't see it very well. I won't use that one again. Through these, you may become partakers of the divine nature. The term partaker is a Greek word for fellowship. It's communion. I can commune in the divine nature. You know, when we were created in the image and likeness of God, my emotions, my thoughts, my plans for you, my use for you, was all under the heading of divine nature. In other words, it was agape love, Righteousness and justice and equity. Talk about that in the bulletin I wrote yesterday on the website. That God has lived a lifestyle in heaven. He wanted that lifestyle to be lived here on earth. He created us that way. But Eve selfishly took something from God that she had no right to have. And started a cascade effect to where now these people, these partakers of the divine nature, are strangers and exiles. They're the few in the midst of an ungodly group of people. We become partakers of the divine nature. You may become partakers. This is totally, it's like the switch. You may have light if you turn that switch on. You may have water if you turn your faucet on. You may have a cooked meal in your oven if you know how to turn it on and put the right temperature in there. You may, well, what do you mean may? Well, it's up to you. The choice is yours. The gospel is here. The power is here. The promises are here. It's what I choose to do with them that determines how quickly I become a partaker of the divine nature. You say, well, wait a minute. By grace, don't I become a partaker of the divine nature after I'm baptized into Christ? Well, that's true. But you know, you're the same person the day after you're baptized you were the day before. You've got to do that part yourself. That's up to you. You may become partakers having escaped from the corruption that is the world by lust. That's what I am. The day after I'm baptized, I've escaped from the corruption that is in the world by lust. But now I got a choice to make. And that's what this verse, that's what this section is all about. So we come now to uh, just summarizing this. Paul says we were helpless. We were enemies. We were without strength when God sent Jesus to die. If Jesus had not died on the cross, we could not be saved. We all understand that. We were dead in our trespasses. How could we make ourselves alive? God did that for us. We were without hope, without God, without the promises. So the gospel is the power. But I have to unlock that power with faith and submission. So that's what God did. And then, of course... With that divine power, he gave me the promise of salvation, the promise of the resurrection, the promise of being children of God, a living hope, and every spiritual blessing. These are fixed. They're given to everyone. The minute you obeyed the gospel, you heard, you believed, you confessed. Excuse me. You heard, you believed, you repented, you confessed, and you were baptized. You get up out of the water of baptism, you have salvation. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. You will be raised from the dead. You now are the children of God. We do have a living hope. We have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. But what about us? What are we going to do with that? That's what God did. 
What about you and I? Well, that's where Peter goes next. After the means and the motivation, the divine power and the precious promises, becoming partakers. So what God has done is he's given us the opportunity, just like the initial creation. When I see the physical creation, I see opportunity. You know, America is called the land of opportunity. People come here with nothing and with hard work and effort and energy, they build their life. And most of us are very happy with the life we've built here. I can tell you something. I've been to Malawi. I've been to Zimbabwe. I've been to Mozambique. I have been to India. And I can tell you that there are places in the world today where no matter how hard you work, you could never get ahead. No matter what kinds of abilities and opportunities you have, you will stay where you are. It's a crushing thing. When I was in India looking at the, ta at the castes and thinking about these people can't ever fix this. We can move. We start at the bottom. We can build ourselves up. Can't do that. But you can do that with the gospel. With the gospel, you can start at the bottom like Paul and go to the very top. With the gospel, you can start at the bottom. A drug addict, a fornicator, a thief, a reviler. Paul talked about even homosexuals. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were cleansed. Now what? Here you are. Where are you going to go with it? And so, having escaped the corruption in the world through lust, now the world is at our fingertips. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? For this very cause, because grace and peace are multiplied, because God has given us his divine power, because he has given us his precious and exceedingly great promises, because he has allowed us to escape the corruption that is in the world through lust, for this very reason, adding on your part all diligence. Now, this is the American Standard. The American Standard is the only translation that translates all the words in this sentence. Because there's two words for giving, and most of them only use the one. But literally, this is for this very reason, adding on your part. And I want you to notice the Greek definition. Para is the word we have before parable. It means beside. Ace is the what we have between repent and be baptized and remission of sins in Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized unto the remission of your sins. So para, beside, ace, into, or for the purpose of, and then Pharaoh, which is to carry. So to bring in on the side or to bring in beside. To add, 2 Peter 1.5, adding on your part, revised version. The words on your part represent the intensive force of the verb. The King James giving does not provide an adequate meaning. And I agree with him there. We have a triple compound word. And unless you put adding on your part... Adding is the para. Adding on is the ace. Your part is the pharaoh. All three are broken in and then we have the full picture. So we've seen God's part. Now Peter wants to talk about our part. What's your part in all this? Adding on your part. Like I said, there is so much work and effort to get electricity into my home. Somebody builds a dam or a coal power plant. They plant those power lines all the way to my house, getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Then it gets to my house and they put mine underground. So mine comes underground, it comes up, and then it's in this little gray box, just like yours is. And then there's these little circuit breakers that go in, and then it comes into the house, and then there's switches and plugs 
and all sorts of things that I can do. I can cook, I can clean, I can be entertained, I can learn, I can study. There's so many things I can do if I know how to add on my part. Some of you have computers, you have no clue what to do with them. Others have computers and they do amazing things with them. Why? Because some have added on their part and some haven't. It. It's all fixed, the opportunities. So the power in the gospel is just like electricity or just like gasoline in your car or just like natural gas. You want to heat your home? You want to go somewhere? Add on your part. You put in the key. You turn on the ignition. I see somebody pushing the car. Why are you pushing the car? Well, isn't it what you do with cars? No, you sit in the car and the car drives you. Well, how do you do that? Well, you put the key in. So God here is telling us the gospel will drive you. But you have to add on your part. <clears throat> And so we add on our part all diligence. And so in your faith, you supply virtue. In your virtue, you supply knowledge. In your knowledge, you supply self-control. Remember, this is adding on your part. In your self-control, perseverance or patience. In your patience, godliness. In your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. So we put that all together and then we come to the final section. And it's just my purpose today. I'm not intending it even to, to even talk about these seven things. We'll talk about them one a week for the next few weeks. But for this morning, I just want to get us fired up. I want to get us excited. I want us to get us to understand God, God expects this from us. Now here's what he says. If these things are yours... What things? These seven things. Virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. If these things are yours and abound. Now those are two fascinating words. We'll save this for later, but these are two interesting words. One is the being appointed to an office. If you want to be an elder, then you have to have the qualifications. If the qualifications are yours, you can be an elder. If they're not, you won't be an elder. If these things, these seven things are yours and abounding, that's a word, that's an agricultural term. It means it just keeps building and building and building. If, if these things are yours and abound, they make you to be not idle nor unfruitful. Make you to be is another interesting word. That means to be appointed to an office. These things appoint you to being busy. You remember in 2 Timothy 2, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. In a great house, there are vessels of gold and silver, some for honor, some for dishonor. If a man will purge himself, well, I can guarantee you this. If you add virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love, you're going to have purged yourself. You're going to be a vessel unto honor, meet for the master's use. If the Lord sees us just brimming to the full with these seven things because we've added and worked and added and studied and added and worked and kept going... He's going, to put, he's going to appoint us to be busy. He that lacks these things is blind. If you don't have faith, or excuse me, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love, if you don't have those, you're blind. Boy, Alan, you're pretty judgmental. No, I, don't, I didn't say it. Peter said it. Well, wait a minute. No, Peter didn't say it. The Holy Spirit inspired him to say it. These are God's words. If you don't have these things, God says you are blind. And how am I going to use you? You can't even see clearly. You can't be able to guide people or help people because you're blind. Seeing only what is near, having forgotten the cleansing from his old sins. Wherefore, brethren, you see those blue? Those are connecting terms. Wherefore, therefore, because... If these things are yours, you'll be busy and fruitful. Because if you don't have these things, you'll be blind. Wherefore, brethren, give them more diligence. Work even harder to add these seven things to your faith to make your calling and election sure. Now, your calling and election are two of the most critical elements. Do you remember Jesus saying many are called? And few are chosen? We've been called. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. God called us through the gospel. When we obeyed the gospel, he called me, but I won't make that calling and election stable and steadfast and sure unless I add these seven things to my faith. Again, these are not my words. This is the Holy Spirit. Give the more diligence to make your calling and election sure, stable, steadfast, fixed. For if 
you do these things, you shall never stumble. What a promise. If I'll just keep working on these seven things, if I'll just keep studying and memorizing and working and mastering and going over my day, and did I lack virtue here? Was there, was there an issue with self-control today? Did I not manifest enough love? Was I not a brotherly kind person when I had an opportunity? I mean, these are things that are just flitting back and forth in your mind because they're, they've become a fundamental part of us. They're ours. If you do these things, you're never going to stumble. For thus, or in this way, shall be richly supplied unto you the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When I'm in Malawi and uh, we're, we're talking about this verse, I remind them that everywhere they go, they, they get on a minibus and the conductor comes. The minibus is a small minivan, a uh, very small minivan. I think it's, about, it's a little smaller than the one that uh, uh, Steve used to have. I don't know if he has it anymore or not. But uh, it's a very small minivan. They'll stick 15, 16 people in this thing. They're just all kind of crunched together. And the conductor will come along, 200 kwacha, 200 kwacha. 200. Well, if you don't have 200 kwacha, they're going to stop and throw you out. Because you don't have what is necessary to go from here to there. Well, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Jesus Christ will be richly supplied if I have these seven things added to my faith and denied if I don't. Again, these verses, 8, 9, 10, and 11, they add such a punch to these terms. And they show us their value. And that was really my only intention in this lesson, was just to put this thing back in our minds so we can see it. Peter said, I want you to remember these things. Now we see the context. Now that we've gone through 3 through 11, we can go back and we can look at that. So these are the things that it will do. And I've already emphasized that enough times. So this is what Peter wants me to remember. Now I know what he wants me to remember. He wants me to remember that, that his divine power has given me all things that pertain to life and godliness. That he has given me precious and exceedingly great promises. That I have escaped the corruption that is in the world. That I am to add on my part. And I am to add to my faith virtue and knowledge and self-control and perseverance and godliness and brotherly kindness and love because if these things are yours and abound you'll be busy you'll be fruitful you won't be blind the entrance into the eternal kingdom will be abundantly supplied you will never stumble wow i can see why peter wants me to remember this what he's done is he's boiled down the gospel into seven things and said, if you'll do these seven things, you will be in the gospel. You will be obeying the gospel. This is just a nice way to summarize it. And I realize that, that that's a pretty small amount of things. But brethren, over the years, as you add these things to your faith, you're going to find that everything in the gospel is summed up in those seven words, just like Peter said they were. So, as we conclude, Peter wants us to remember these things. Now, some people see these like stairs. First you add virtue, then you add knowledge, then self-control, then perseverance. Other people see them like a garden that you're tending, that I have my plot over here, just like I have watermelon here and pumpkin here and Maybe I have uh, sunflower seeds over here, and maybe I have tomatoes here and corn over here, and so I'm tending them. Well, I have virtue here, knowledge here. doesn't really matter how you see this. The point is, Peter said he wanted us to remember, and he said if you have them, you're going to be blessed with eight things. And so there's no way to misunderstand what Peter's trying to get across here. And that's the first chapter. Well, actually, it's just the first uh, 16 verses of the first chapter. But what an amazing sermon. What an amazing piece of information. All tied to the fact that Jesus told me I'm going to put off my tabernacle. I'm going to suffer a very violent death or I'm going to be taken where I don't want to go. Speaking of the kind of death that he would die. Because he died like that, his words are even more impressive. And again, the Holy Spirit put that in there just as an added punch for you and I to think about these things and work on these things. 
And so, brethren, as we prepare to leave here this morning, we pick up the song of invitation. I hope that each one of us can leave here joyfully. These have been a part of my life for the last 20 years. These have been a part of my life for the last 50 years. I've been gaining them and gaining them, and it's so joyful to hear this lesson and to be able to say, I'm there. Now, some of us here may be thinking, this is the first time I've ever heard this. And now I have my marching orders and I'm so excited because now over the next few weeks I'm going to learn what these words are and how I'm supposed to do them and what I'm supposed to do so that I can have these wonderful blessings. But then maybe there's some people here who have heard this sermon over and over again and they still don't have them. And to you I would say, time is getting short. The wrinkles are coming. The hair is turning. We're getting old. Our outward man is decaying. It's time. Past time. To get busy with these things. If we can help you in any way. Either by obeying the gospel this morning. Or publicly confessing sin. Or just asking for prayers. We, we invite you to come. While we together stand and sing number 340.